Let's pray as we come to look at God's word. Father, I thank you again for the wisdom that you gave Solomon as he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. I thank you for the way it speaks into our life and our culture right now. I ask, Lord, that you would open up this word by your Holy Spirit, that we would understand what life is and what life isn't really about. I ask this for your name's sake. Amen. Uh, Ben, would you mind just uh, closing the door? Thank you. Last week, we started the sermon by asking what the meaning of life was. And we saw that people have a variety of opinions about this. Solomon started off chapter one by stating that everything is hebel. Everything is vapour, vanity, something that you can't hold on to. And we were challenged by what he said. The endless cycle, nothing is truly new. And it can be so easy to take that idea and to say, yes, I see that things are meaningless, that things don't seem to have a real purpose. And then we forget. We go out of the church and we go and live a life chasing Hebel anyway. But Solomon is not letting us off that easily. This week, he is on a mission. He's on a mission to find meaning. And to do this, he explores the three, I think it's the three biggest things that people generally find or have the opinion, the three biggest things that give meaning to the lives of so many people. These things are pleasure, wisdom, and work. Pleasure, that's everything involved with pleasure. That's money, that's luxuries, that's relationships, that's sex. Wisdom, that's the search to be intellectually understanding and therefore really know what life is about. Or work, pouring yourself into something and trying to achieve something. How true that is. This was written 3,000 years ago and yet has anything changed? The search for pleasure, the search for wisdom, the search for finding a meaning in work, we are still doing exactly that now. Pleasure, just think, right now we have so much to enjoy. If you look at the history of the world, we surely have the greatest luxuries of any people group that has ever lived. Sure, I'm sure there's like been kings in history that have had more luxury than us, but as general, the average person, if you look about books, TV, film, video games, parks, fast food, cars, phones. We have more pleasure than anyone in the world ever. Wisdom. We're so clever. I have a world's worth of wisdom at my fingertips in my phone. We've put man on the moon. We have libraries full of philosophy and wisdom and science and well-being. And yet, can we now answer the biggest questions of our lives? Why we are here and what our purpose is. What about work? We live in a nation of workaholics, long hours. Over time, we have entrepreneurs springing up all over the place. There is a chance for anybody who works hard at school to go on and have a good career and to make lots of money. Surely, that gives us meaning? Let's join Solomon on his adventure of discovery. So at the end of chapter one, we we didn't read that out in the reading, but at the end of chapter one, Solomon sort of says what he's going to do. In, In verse 12, he says, I, the teacher who was king over Israel in Jerusalem. So again, he's establishing who he is. Being the king, he's coming to it with a place of a lot of riches, a lot of wisdom, and therefore if anybody in human history can really put pleasure and wisdom and work through its paces and see how meaningful it is. It is Solomon. And what he resolves in verse 13, he says, I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heaven. So what he's going to do, he's going to look at everything. The three big things, pleasure, wisdom and work. And because he's such a wise man, he can really look deep into this and analyse this. Now he says, what a heavy burden God has laid 
on mankind. It's almost like he knows that he's not going to find the answer in these three things. In verse 14, he says, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now, again, this idea of things under the sun, we looked at last time, that's everything that's done on this earth. And we see these three phrases appearing again and again. Under the sun, meaningless, which again is the word hebel, and chasing after the wind. I don't know if you've ever heard of the phrase herding cats. You just, there's no point trying to herd them all together. They're just going to walk and do what they like. It's a fruitless exercise. Well, chasing the wind is like that. Imagine seeing somebody running down the street and saying, what are you doing? I'm chasing the wind. What are you going to do when you catch it? Look, I'm creating wind right now. I've caught it. Nothing. That is what these things are. Chasing after the wind. He says in verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened and what is lacking cannot be counted. What's he talking about here? He's talking about wisdom. How wisdom is useful, and we'll come and see shortly how he says wisdom is like having a light compared to not having wisdom, which is like darkness. But wisdom cannot straighten a path that is crooked. It cannot answer the very biggest questions that we have. It cannot find meaning in pleasure. This crookedness, this lacking cannot be straightened out, cannot be accounted for. And not only that, wisdom brings issues itself. Look at verses 16 and 17. I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. Remember, he asked God for wisdom. So God had given him a real portion of wisdom. Verse 17, then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. And I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. If we look at some of the greatest minds, some of the greatest philosophers that have existed throughout the centuries, many of them disagree on big issues. Many of them were frustrated that they could not get to the heart of what the point of all of this is for. The pastor Warren Wisby, about this section, he writes, those who go through life living on explanations will always be unhappy for at least two reasons. Firstly, this side of heaven, there are no explanations for some things that happen. And we know that. Some of the suffering, some of the things we see in this world, there are no explanations on this side of heaven. And God is not obligated to explain them anyway. Secondly, God has ordained that people live by promises and not explanations. That we may have faith and not sight. Think about John 20, 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. God has not given us all the answers right now. And therefore, if finding the answer to everything is the basis of your life right now, you're not going to be happy. Wisdom does not give us all the answers. And do you know what? Wisdom actually gives us sorrow. Look at verse 18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge the more grief. Think about it. How can wisdom bring sorrow? Let me give an illustration. Imagine you're a parent. Well, there are many parents in this room that don't need to imagine it. And you have a child of yours who is going off the rails. You have perhaps experienced what they're experiencing. Maybe they're pursuing a relationship with somebody who you just think is the worst person they could be dating. And you have seen other people in your life date people like that and their lives get ruined as a result. And you know, because of your wisdom, because of your knowledge, that there is heartbreak and pain in what they're doing. But they, they have no idea. They don't have the experience. They don't have the wisdom. And they're thinking, this is great. And really, they are heading towards a huge hole. That's an example of how wisdom can be a source of sorrow. What about Jesus? In his knowledge, in Luke 13, 34, when he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones the ones who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together like a, a, a chick gathers her hens under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus knows that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed fairly soon afterwards. And he's saying, Oh, that you were willing to come to me. 
Again, Jesus has the knowledge, and with the knowledge comes great sorrow. And what's facing Solomon here, because he's so clever, because he has so much wisdom, he knows that there is going to be sorrow with this experiment that he then does. And so he starts, armed with this wisdom which he knows cannot answer the questions, he begins his journey to find meaning. First stop, pleasure. Verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proves to be meaningless. He's almost like a scientist, you know, doing an experiment. I'm sure when we did science at school, we all did experiments. Like what happens if you put this thing in that and you record it and you make notes? Well, that is what Solomon is doing. He is testing himself with pleasure. But you know what? Pleasure can be a massive test for all of us. Do you know what? I would actually say that pleasure is more of a test of where our hearts are really at than adversity is. Because in trials, in suffering, we can be so quick to run to God and say, God, help me, deliver me from this. And as soon as things get easy again, we forget about him. Think about the Israelites in the Old Testament. They're in the wilderness. They're crying out, God, feed us. He sends them manna. He sends them quail and they eat. They're backed up against the the shores of the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming and they cry out. And Moses calls out to God and God opens the Red Sea. They're crying out to God in the midst of suffering. But the moment they're in the promised land, they've got milk and honey and all sorts of wonderful things. And they don't need to cry out to God anymore. Their hearts go cold and they start chasing after idols. Isn't that so true of us? Pleasure is a test. Times of ease are a test for us. Because we are so quick to take our eyes away from God. Proverbs uh, 25, 16 says, If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you will vomit. With pleasure, we need to be so disciplined about how much we allow ourselves to have. So what's the aim of Solomon's test? He says, I'll test you with pleasure to find out what is good. He's asking, is pleasure going to find or provide a good enough reason for human existence and human aims. Well, spoiler alert, straight away he answers it in verse one. He says, this also proved to be meaningless. Okay, he's not beating around the bush here. He's telling you right away, in case you were doubting, pleasure will prove to be meaningless. Again, quoting Warren Wiersbe, he says, today's world, and we know this, is pleasure mad. Millions of people will pay almost any amount of money to buy experiences to buy pleasure, to buy escape, and to escape the burdens of life. While there's nothing wrong with fun, Wearsby says, innocent fun, the person who builds his or her life on seeking pleasure is bound to be disappointed by the end. Don't we know that to be true? Don't we know that to be true? That whenever we've chased after pleasure and made that our number one thing, we're always left feeling empty at the end. We're always left feeling like something is missing. Solomon says in verse 2, laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? Isn't that a question we all need to ask ourselves? What does pleasure accomplish? Uh, You know that feeling after you've really binged on something, whether it's a food that you enjoy or a TV show that you enjoy or an activity that you enjoy. And afterwards, you're just left feeling like, what have I accomplished? Like, I'm still feeling empty and I still either want more or I've binged so much that I feel sick. I don't feel good, I don't feel relaxed, but the next night you want to do it all over again. And it's just this cycle, and you're never, ever full. You're never, ever satisfied. The moment, my friends, that you decide in your heart that pleasure is what you want to seek to give you fulfillment and meaning and happiness is the moment that pleasure becomes totally empty. That's what sin does. You know, you know the analogy, I don't know if anybody's ever been in the desert before, but when you're in the desert, because of the haze of heat that rises from the sand, it can look like there's water. It looks like there's water reflecting the sky. Mirages are the common word for it. And you can have some poor person in the desert who is so thirsty, and they see water just over that hill. And they walk, and they walk, and they get to it, it's just sand. But you look up, there's water. 
And you keep going. And every time you get to it, you realize it was just a mirage. It was empty. And you keep going and going and going. And then you die of thirst. Isn't that like pleasure? You enjoy something and you realize actually it's not empty. But then the next thing comes up. Another film, another game, another activity. And you do that and it's empty. And then you do the next one and then the next one. And then one day you just die. There is never a moment where you are like, I am satisfied. Well, that is what sin is. And making pleasure an idol is like a desert mirage. It is so deceitful and it is not the meaning of life. Now, look at what Solomon does in his experiment. So firstly, he says in verse three, I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. Now, what he's doing, he's almost like a, a doctor who's examining the progress of his own disease. He's like, right, so I'm going to embrace this folly. I'm going to chase after this pleasure, but my wisdom is still guiding me. And so look what he does. And look at just this list from verse 4 to verse 9. Just, just look at what he had and what, what he accomplished. He said, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards, made gardens. I, I made reservoirs. Um, I bought male and female slaves and other slaves who were born in my house. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone else in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces, female and male singers, a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. This is a crazy list of stuff. He had the finest houses in the country. He owned people to do his bidding. He had flocks and herds. A modern day equivalent would be lots of shares and stocks and investment options. He had silver and gold. He had all sorts of treasures. He had singers. He had a harem full of, of beautiful women to do what he wanted with whenever he wanted with. He had fame. If you look at 1 Kings 10, let me just read out a small snippet from 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 18, of just some of his lifestyle. It's just crazy. It says, Moreover, the king made, this is Solomon, a great throne of ivory and overlaid this throne with pure gold. The throne had six steps. The top of the throne was round at the back. There were armrests on either side of the seat and two lions stood beside the armrests. Twelve lions stood there, one on each side of the six steps. Nothing like this had been made for any other kingdom. Then down to verse 22. For the king had merchant ships at sea with a fleet of Hiram. Once every three years, the merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes and monkeys. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. There was no king like Solomon. He had everything, money, sex, power. He had so many wives. He had so much power. He had everything. Now, if you look, it's really sad. If you look at verses 4 to 9 again in Ecclesiastes 2, just look, look how often the word myself and I appear in this. It's all about him. He's trying to chase this pleasure for himself. He's acquiring riches for himself. He's acquiring women to sleep with for himself. He's acquiring fame for himself. It's all about himself and his pleasure. Now, just stop for a moment. Just look at some of the things in this list. How many of these things are people striving for in this world right now? A greater treasury, a bigger bank balance, better houses, more possessions, beautiful people to date or to sleep with, fame. It's all about themselves. All of these things that Solomon had are what so many of us, maybe some people in this church right now, are chasing in their life. And you're thinking, if I can just get that person or have that house or have this much in my bank balance, I will be happy. Solomon did not deny himself. Look at verse 10. He said, I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Every whim, every urge that he had, he followed through with it. He, he just didn't hold anything back. When you have his power and his money, there was nothing that he could not buy. And he says in the second part of verse 10, my heart took delight in all my labour because this was the reward of my toil. And we know that sometimes there is a momentary pleasure in accomplishments. You know that feeling after a, a long day's work or when you've worked hard to achieve something, you're like, yes, I feel good right now. But even that does not provide meaning because look at verse 11, look what he says. Yet when I surveyed that all my hands had done 
and all that I toiled to achieve, everything was hebel. Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. All of that pleasure, all those houses, all those piles of jewels and gems, all those women that he could do things with, they all amounted to hebel. Meaningless. They did not make him happy. And right now, imagine that we are climbing up a mountain. Everyone in this world is climbing up a mountain. They're thinking, oh, if I could just get up there where the money is, where the sex is, where the fame is, then I'll be happy. And where everyone's climbing up and people are at different levels. And I think, if only I can get up there. And it's like we're climbing up and Solomon leans over and says, don't do it. It's all hebel. There's nothing good up here. Because let's be honest, he's got far higher than any of us will ever get. He's been there before us and he said, it's not worth it. It is hebel. You will not find satisfaction. So let me ask you, is pleasure the thing that gives you meaning in life? And if so, how's that working out for you? Is having luxury and treats and toys and sex and fame, is that what's giving you meaning in life? Because it will not satisfy you. You know it in your heart. Even if we didn't read Solomon's words today, you would know that in your heart already. That Solomon is living proof. Well, what about wisdom then? He's given us an intro in wisdom at the end of chapter 1, but then he dives into it in verse 12 here. He says, Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can a king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. Now, of course, we see here wisdom is better than folly. It's like having a torch on a road and you can see things that you might trip over. Wisdom is good. The book of Proverbs in the Bible is full of wisdom and the importance of wisdom. And a life lived with wisdom will have generally less problems than a life lived with folly. But, in verse 14, what does he come to realise? The same fate overtakes them both. Imagine that you're on a path and you've got a light and you've got wisdom and you have a foolish person who's on the same path and they haven't got a light. Sure, they're going to trip over a lot more times on this path, but the destination is the same. You're both going to die. And ultimately, what benefit has that wisdom given you? Yes, you perhaps had a smoother road, but the destination is the same. You're still going to die. Plato and Aristotle were far more intelligent and wise than I am. And yet they're dead. And one day I'm going to die. What value does wisdom give you. Dwayne Garrett, in his commentary about this, he says, wisdom is like light. The wise know where they're going, even if they only know that they're heading for trouble. They therefore can avoid some disasters and be prepared for others. Fools, however, are always surprised by the events that befall them. The wise man can see death coming and contemplate it. This is better than the mindless tumble taken into death by the fool, but Ultimately, he says, the wise and the fools are equal heirs of human mortality. Whether you are wise or not, the same fate awaits us all. And so in verse 15, he says to himself, well, the fate of the fool, i.e. death, that's going to happen to me too. What do I gain from being wise? If anything, being wise has made him more depressed because he sees how empty and meaningless it all is. My friends, worldly wisdom cannot, cannot give us meaning. And so Solomon, you see, is getting quite depressed here. Look in verse 17. He says, so I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Everything's hebel. Everything's chasing after the wind. You can chase all you like, but you won't catch it. And if you do try and catch it, you open your hand and nothing is there. What does it profit? It's almost like he's having a deathbed experience, but just earlier in life. You know, when we're all on our deathbeds, my friends, all of the money that you earned, the people that you've slept with, that will not mean a single thing when you're looking down the barrel of eternity and God's judgment. You will not care about what it is that you've achieved in your life. So then he looks at his work, the things that he's achieved, and he achieved a lot. And you can tell already in verse 18 and 19 how he's feeling about these things. He says, I hated all the things I toiled for under the sun. 
because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over the fruit of my toil, which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Like I said last time, we have people in this church who have worked very hard, worked very hard lives. There are some people that have two jobs, people do long hours. We have a a church of hard workers. But like we said last time, we can't take a single penny of that with us when we die. I've mentioned it before, but my my grandfather uh, was the managing director of Yardley, you know, the cosmetic firm uh, in London. He was was really, really well off, you know, popular, uh, uh, quite well known in business circles. He had a lot of money, but just seeing him dying in those last few months, a couple of years ago, they didn't profit him at all. The money and the things that he had earned up for himself, that did not profit him a single amount. And he ended up having to leave his possessions to his uh, extended family. He had no control over how the money was spent. Do you know that um, it's a common thing that in most cases, when you leave money, even large amounts of money, all of that money is gone by the third generation and you have no control over how it's spent. And Solomon, you can see here that he's beginning to think, I've got to leave all of this, my throne, my houses, my building projects, I've got to leave all of this to my son. Now Solomon's son was a guy called Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was a foolish man. He was not wise. Do you know that actually when he takes over from his father, his father's counsellors, these wise old men, say, Rehoboam, you should treat the people in this way. And Rehoboam says, I'm not going to listen to you. And he asks all the young men, who grew up, his mates who grew up with him, and they say, no, no, treat the people this way. And he does. He goes with the advice of the young men. And do you know what? The kingdom splits. And all of the, most of the kingdom that his father owned, Rehoboam loses it in a few days. All of these projects that Solomon had worked for and achieved meant nothing in the hands of his son, Rehoboam. Every single thing, every penny that you have that you're going to leave on this earth when you die is going to go to somebody else and they might squander it. You might have somebody living in your house who's going to trash your house up 50 years from now. Who knows? We can't take a single thing with us. And so in verse 20, he says, So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labour under the sun. For a person may labour with wisdom and knowledge and skill. And then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for the toil and anxious striving which they labour under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. And even at night... Their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. We work so hard, don't we? And, we? and some of us are very good at our jobs. We're trying to be better at our jobs. We work with skill and wisdom and knowledge. And it's stressful. We work hard during the day and then sometimes at night. I know, I'm sure we all know this feeling when you've had a difficult day at work or when you've got a difficult day the next day. You lie there at night and your mind is buzzing and you're thinking about it and it's consuming you. And all of this pain and effort and stress, for what? For something you can't hold on to. What do we get for this? Our society, my friends, you know this, our society is built around work. Our children are raised and geared to work and to have a good career. And work is good. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve responsibilities. Work is a good thing. As human beings, we are designed to work. But the moment that work becomes our source of meaning is when emptiness happens and yet so many people in our culture right now do that they live and breathe for their work and ultimately it yields them nothing is that you today is your job your idol something that you think gives you purpose and meaning and you are chasing 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 and you will never get anything eternally useful from it and so after examining these three things Pleasure, wisdom and work, Solomon concludes in 24 to 26. He says, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? We are trapped, as it like, as you like, under the sun. But notice God's role in this. He is the one who gives enjoyment. If you forget God and you just focus 
on pleasure, or you focus on wisdom, worldly wisdom, or you focus on work, you will never enjoy those things. But if God is in your life, if you are looking to him for your happiness and your meaning, then you will enjoy those three things. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not here, I'm not slagging off pleasure, I'm not slagging off wisdom, I'm not slagging off work, because those things are given to us by God. They are good things. The Bible says that God gives us all things richly to enjoy. But the moment you make them your God, and you put him out of the picture, you will just have emptiness. With God in the mix, we can look at these three things, and we can take joy. Think about pleasure. In 1 Timothy 6, 7, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. If your hope is in God, you get all the other stuff as well, and you can enjoy it. Remember that the kindness and the pleasures of this world, do you know what Romans 2, Paul writes in Romans 2 verse 4? He says... That God's kindness, that's the things he's given us, are designed to lead us to repentance. They're designed to show us that we need God. Think about wisdom. God has taken worldly wisdom and he's turned it on its head. The very message of the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness to the world. People think we're crazy for believing in Jesus and what he did for us. And yet Paul, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, he says, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but it's not, he says, the wisdom of this age, which is coming to nothing. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God has destined for our glory since before time began. Do not think that the wisdom of this world, all the philosophers and atheists out there will give you meaning. The wisdom of God, which is foolishness to so many people, is the true wisdom which guides us. And finally, work. Like I've said, we are designed to work, but it will not give our lives meaning. In John 6, 27, Jesus says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but work for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. My friends, work that you do for God's glory, for God's honour, does have eternal implications is worth it. And so I beg you, look to God to find meaning. Look to God to truly enjoy the pleasures that he's given you. Look to God to find true wisdom. And look to God to find real fulfilment from the work he gives you to do. If you remove God, you remove meaning and you are chasing after the wind. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we think about what you said, what life really is in John 10.10. Lord Jesus, you said that you came that we may have life and have it to the full. Lord, we want to live full lives on this earth. Lord, we want to enjoy the pleasures that you've given us. We want to enjoy the wisdom that you've made available to us by your word. Lord, we want our work to be work that has eternal implications. But Lord, we cannot do any of these things without you. Lord, we are so sorry for how often we have put pleasure or worldly wisdom or work as our God. We've put all our meaning and our stock in these things, thinking if only we have that, we will be satisfied. And yet, Lord, we know that is not true. Lord, we pray that you would help us to put you first, to understand that Jesus Christ came, that we may have a relationship with you that we may have pleasure and wisdom and work in their place, that we may enjoy them because you give us the ability to enjoy them. Oh, Lord God, we just pray that our lives would be the right perspective. Lord, may we remember Solomon and all of his money and sex and fame and how that profited him. Nothing. It was a chasing after the wind. Help us to chase after you and you only. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.